Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video we're kicking off a new five-part series for Plasticity Beginner Solid Modeling. Now in this series, we're going to go through a lot of the more common tools and tips that you need along the way to begin modeling pretty much anything that you need inside of Plasticity. Remember, if you're looking to buy Plasticity, we are an affiliate, and if you use the code LEAD10 at checkout, you'll get yourself 10% off either the indie or studio versions. So in this first episode, we're going to be looking at starting shapes, how to begin a design either using primitives or curved base solids. In the second episode, we'll move on to edges and offsets, talking more about how we can use offsets, we can use imprint for curves, isoprams, and cutting solids. In episode three, we're going to get deeper into patterns, looking at linear, radial, and curve-driven arrays, as well as how we can duplicate solids and objects. In our fourth episode, we'll dive a bit deeper into the tools that we need to add small details, things like using pipes for cutting away features, and the knife tool for our curves. And in our final episode, we'll be doing a modeling practice where we're looking at creating a power generation cell. So without further ado, let's get started in plasticity. Now, if you're brand new to plasticity, I suggest that you check out our quick start guide. The beginning of that video, we talk more about the UI, where things are located, what tools you need, and just some basic shortcuts that you want to know. We're not going to be doing that through this series. We're more focusing on the tools as we get to them. We'll still call out all the shortcuts we use, but if you're really struggling to figure out how to use plasticity, I do suggest that you start there. The first thing that we want to do is delete our cube. And note that my selection manager currently has everything selected. That's going to be the numbers across the top of your keyboard using either number five to get all selection or tab if nothing else is selected and active. With that said, note that I am using the metric unit system. By default, when you're in plasticity, the units are going to be meters. The units don't really matter in this case. It's just simply a matter that we want to make sure that our scale is correct. So if you're using inches or centimeters or millimeters, don't worry too much about it because we're not going to be focusing on those numbers. But to get started, on the right-hand side, we've got all of our curve tools that we're going to go over. And then we've got sphere, a corner box, and a cylinder. These are considered primitive shapes. The main reason that they're primitives is because we don't need to create curves first. They're sort of baked into that tool. We're going to start with the cylinder, select the origin, drag it out, pull it up in 3D, right-click, and we're done. Now, if you want to make any changes to those dimensions, unfortunately, the dimension tool does not work. You need to create them at the time of creation for the cylinder. So I'm going to use G and X and move it out of the way. We'll create another one. And as we begin dragging this out, if I hit tab on the keyboard, I can manually enter a five. So it's five meters. I'm going to hit enter twice. I'm going to pull this up in 3D space. Now, if I hit tab here, it doesn't do anything. However, I can come over here and manually enter the value five, and that's going to create our five meter cylinder height. Now that there are a couple of other handles here, this is going to increase the diameter and that's going to increase the height. Those will, of course, override whatever you've already typed in. So just hit enter twice to accept it. I'm going to go ahead and hide that. We don't really need to see it. But just keep in mind that those dimensions need to be entered at the time of creation. We have a couple of extra options when we're talking about boxes and spheres. With the corner box, we'll start at the origin. We're going to hit C on the keyboard, which you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. That's going to change it to a center type box. Now, this is important because whenever we start modeling, we want to make use of symmetry whenever possible. So making sure that you start about the origin is always helpful. Now, if we want to make this a true square, we can hit S on the keyboard. That's going to lock the X and Y dimensions. However, if you hit tab and you start to manually enter some values, you will be overriding that. So just note you will have to manually enter this. Hit enter to accept the dimension, enter one more time, and then we can pull this up. Once again, tab allows us to go back and forth between those dimensions, but it's not going to give us that Z dimension. So you will need to come in and manually enter 6.5 and hit enter. Now, I mentioned that the dimension tool, which is very helpful for going back and resizing these, is available for the corner box and the sphere. If you don't know shortcut keys, that's perfectly fine. You can always go to see all commands and you can simply scroll through here or you can search by starting to type in dimension in this case if you know what you're looking for. 
And the F key on the keyboard is find, which also brings up the exact same menu. You can see that dimension here is the equal key. I have had a couple of comments from people saying that hasn't worked for them, whether it's the, a laptop or a certain configuration of computer, I'm not really sure, but you can always get to every command by going through that find dialog. When we use the dimension tool, we can tab back and forth between all three dimensions, which is a great way for us to ensure that this is truly a, an equal cube or a box. We'll right click to accept and G and Y to move it out of the way. And then we'll do the same thing with a sphere. Now, once again, the sphere, we can enter the dimensions at the time of creation. We can manually pull it in and out. And then we can also hit equals to get back to our dimension tools after the fact. Now, one important note about the dimension tools, as soon as we begin manipulating geometry, so for example, if I use control and R, which is an isoparam tool, which we will talk about in a future episode, that's gonna allow us to split this up and make some changes to the geometry. As soon as we do that, the dimension tool will no longer work. Uh, one of the strange things is if I select this top face and delete it, then select this object, now the dimension tool does work for whatever reason, but just keep in mind that whenever you're using the creation of a primitive and you're using the dimension tool, you really wanna make sure that that happens at its original creation. As Soon as you start making changes or modifications like adding fillets and chamfers, do not expect the dimension tool to still work. So I'm gonna drag this out of the way and I actually, you know what, let's go ahead and hide all these. We don't need to see them. The next thing that we wanna move into is curve-based designs. So for this, it's important that we use planes. Now you can use the default planes using one, three, or seven on your numpad. You can also hold down control in those same numbers and you'll get to the opposing plane. So seven is top, control and seven is bottom, for example. It's just important that we use planes whenever we're using construction geometry or curves because it can be extremely difficult to make sure that is in the correct plane and it needs to be planar for us to create extrudes revolve sweeps and things like that so as we get started i'm going to use a very basic example just use some lines and just create some shape you can create whatever shape you want the important thing here is that it's a closed profile the second thing i'm going to do is just create another line just somewhere down here below it parallel to the x-axis and then rotate this around Two of the easiest and most common ways to create a solid off of our curves is to select a closed profile and just simply pull it up into 3D. When we pull it up, a couple of additional manipulators we see, this white circle allows us to taper that in and out, and this yellow dot at the bottom allows us to make this a thin wall or shelled part inside or outside. So you can pick as you go by just simply dragging that, right click, and now we've created a solid body. Now, if I hit G and X, that solid body is not attached or tied to our original closed profile. So we can delete it or do whatever we want with it, move it around. It doesn't really matter. As soon as it's created, they're no longer linked or bound together. So what I want to do is hide that extrude. And now I want to take that same profile, but this time I'm going to use a revolve. When we have a revolve, we're going to take that closed profile in order to create a solid. And then we need to select two points on an edge, a line. This is gonna be the axis of revolution. This is gonna allow us to create a solid. I'm gonna go ahead and move that in X. But if we do the same thing, but this time our axis of revolution is somewhere away from that profile, you'll see that using the exact same input, we were able to create a different shape. Now, this is true. Let's go ahead and just hide this with H on the keyboard. If I take this profile and I revolve it, let's say around this axis, Again, same exact profile, now we get a different shape. So playing around with using things like extrudes and revolves can be a great way to get started on somewhat complex designs, especially with the revolve tool. But there are a couple of other tools that are important. So I'm gonna take this profile, I'm gonna use Shift D to duplicate it, pull it up in space and hit S twice. I'm gonna do the same thing again, Shift D, duplicate it and pull it down gonna hit S twice to scale it up. And then I'm gonna hit R to rotate it. I'm gonna rotate it about this X axis a little bit and just sort of move it. We're gonna go ahead and shift select all three profiles. Then we're gonna use the loft tool, which is L on the keyboard, but you can also search for this if you want. So L, 
let's go ahead and, and hit escape and we'll just use the find tool so you can see L-O-F-T is gonna give us the loft here. So what we're gonna do is select each profile, hit L on the keyboard, and then it's gonna automatically loft between this. Now, loft needs at least two profiles. If they're closed, we'll be creating a solid. If they're open, we'll create a sheet or a surface. Now with those, we can have additional profiles. As you can see here, we've got three, but we can also use guide curves. Now keep in mind with guide curves for something like a loft, they need to be touching, they really should be touching the profiles. If they're not touching the profiles, you'll likely are going to get an error. One thing about creating a loft is that it can take a little bit of time to figure out where those profiles need to be to get the shape that you're looking for. There are other tools, and for this, I'm going to use a spline curve just somewhere over here. Right click, rotate this around. And when we select this profile, we've got another tool called Sweep. Now, Sweep allows us to take a single closed profile, and then we can sweep it along a guide curve. Now, there are additional guides that we can use for more control, but one of the main benefits here is that the sweep profile doesn't actually have to touch the guide curve. It can be off in space somewhere, but you will get some interesting effects if they aren't starting at the same location. In this case, we're starting roughly on the x-axis, and if I right-click and I hide this, and I try to do that same thing with this profile here, for example, what you'll notice is that we're going to get a different shape. Now, the reason we get a different shape is because the profile relative to the guide curve is different. So while it isn't necessary that your profile and guide curve or loft or sweep path, I should say, that they don't intersect, it is important that they do at least start at the same level. And if it's important to you, make sure that they do have the same normal direction. Now, that's going to make a big difference for the way in which your shapes start. And what I mean by that is if I get rid of this curve and I start with this line and I come up and sort of come over and do this, B on the keyboard for my fillet tool to just round those off. And now I take this profile and I sweep it along this. Now what this means is that this first section here is going normal to its profile. So as if we just extruded it straight up and then it can bend around those other curves and profiles. So while it's not strictly required, it is helpful and it is important, especially when we're trying to have greater control over our shapes. Now there are plenty of other things we can do and I'm gonna talk about just a few more examples here. The next one is spiral. And a spiral tool is extremely helpful. We're gonna select two points on the Z axis and drag this out. There are options where we can change the number of turns, we can taper it in and out, but for right now, we're just gonna create a basic spiral. The next thing that we wanna do with it selected is use what's called the pipe tool. Now the pipe tool is pretty handy. What this allows us to do is it allows us to make a curved profile, in this, this case, it's gonna be round, around or across whatever our guide is. Now, in this case, we're using a spiral. It could be a straight line or a spline. It doesn't really matter. But this is a great way to create things like cooling coils or even using a closed profile on that. We can create things like threads. So it's quick and easy, just like all of the other methods. It just has a very specific application. and You need to play around with and understand how that works. If I were to use just the line tool, for example, and I selected my pipe tool, it works exactly the same. You can see that the pipe is gonna go across there. We can also modify the thickness. So the thickness is going to make this a thin wall. We'd have to zoom in a little bit here to see this. We're gonna make it large, and then we're gonna use this thickness, and then the section size, and you can see we can make a hollow tube. So great way to use a simple input with in this case, just a couple of lines, curves, whatever the case might be, and build out 3D models quickly. Now from here, these are true solids, which means that we can do any of the other tools that we have access to. Things like chamfers and fillets on edges by just pulling them. We can also split them up with curves and imprints. And these are all things that we're gonna get to in future episodes. But for right now, Make sure that you play around with all these tools. Don't have any specific aim in mind. Don't try to replicate some geometry. Just throw some curves at the screen and begin creating some solids. Just get comfortable with the way in which the tools work. 
once you have that down and you're comfortable with doing things like building coils and building pipes off of those coils, you'll find that this process happens relatively quickly and you can start with some pretty intricate solids without too much input at the front end. Once you're done with that, I do suggest that you save your designs. We won't be using these designs in future episodes. We're going to start from scratch every time, but it is always helpful to come back and play around with them and sort of jog your memory when needed. So make sure that you do save it before you move on. If you have any questions on anything you saw here, please let me know. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.